This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. I think you will agree with me. My guest today brings a really nice energy. This was a really enjoyable chat. Now, don't get me wrong. I love all of my conversations. But there's something about Daniel Cable just very pleasant. Now, hiding behind that pleasant exterior is somebody who has done a fair amount of work in the field of neuroscience. Daniel is currently a professor of organizational behavior at the London Business School, and he has been ranked among the top 25 most influential management scholars across the globe. Today, we discuss his work, his new book, Alive at Work, the neuroscience of helping your people love what they do. Think of it this way. Poll after poll has confirmed that a huge number of people, workers, are disengaged from their work. What's happening? Why do people hate work? And then the question becomes, how the heck do we fix it all? Daniel does a great job of getting behind the scenes with research and great writing to show that surprising secret for how we can all help restore our own zest for work, our own zest for life, and to help others restore their zest too. Because you see, this disengagement, it's not just a motivational problem, it's biological. We, us humans, we are designed to explore. We are designed to find new. That's what we want. We are happiest when we have that. But don't let me go too far because Daniel does a better job of explaining this than I ever could. Let's jump right into my conversation with Daniel Cable. a big picture, Dan. I'm sitting here and I'm thinking I'm diving into your work. And, you know, in my own life, whether I'm on the move, going to see something new, traveling somewhere, or doing this podcast where I have so many diverse guests, just like yourself, this novelty, this newness, this experimenting, this exploring, this kind of stuff keeps me alive. And now the funny thing about this, and I'm going to let you run with it, is biologically there's a reason it's keeping me alive and keeping me more happy perhaps than I would otherwise be. I don't know about the biology, but you know all about it, don't you? I read about some things. That's one of the things that's really important for me to always remember is neuroscience is pretty new and I'm not a neuroscientist. <laughs> By that, what I mean is, you know, in the 80s, we didn't really have fMRIs and the ability to hook up machines that let us track the blood in the brain and know what different functions are doing. And also, I'm a psychology guy. And that's real important because while I read a lot of the neuroscience, and I believe I have some really direct answers from those folks, it's not as though that's my firsthand research. My firsthand research has a lot to do with that feeling of being alive at work and that feeling you described of zest or stimulation, mental stimulation that you receive. And why does that feel so valuable when we're trying new things? With that caveat, I really do have some, I think I do have some new insights from the science on what's going on there. And I can kind of run with that if you want. Yes, but let me keep it really big picture for a second, because I think your, your insights, even though today we're going to dive into the concept of work and how some of your insights apply to that, as I raise my big picture point about travel and new experiences, I wasn't talking about work. So I'm assuming I'm assuming like, you know, even though you're applying it to this concept of work, these ideas, the things that I let off with, this is universal in the human condition. I mean, we, we want these things regardless of work or not. That's right. That's right. We wanted these things when there was no such thing as work. It's also really cool that other animals have the same part of the brain. 
there's something really cool and unique that happens when you put this ventral striatum. That's what this part of the brain is called, this ventral striatum. Some people call it the seeking system. When you hook that part of the brain up with a prefrontal cortex, you know, this sort of language system, the simulation center that we humans seem to have, really cool things happen. But to be honest, all animals have this part of the brain that's urging them to explore and learn and take in information about the environment because that's how you adapt. That's, what, that's how you kind of figure out how to secure resources from that environment. For example, animals that you know, don't really have this concept of work, like take a bear that has a cave, is warm, has been fed, it'll still go out ambling in the morning. It'll just go out kind of exploring, like turning over logs and like, <laughs> you know, there's no goal exactly. It's just checking stuff out and seeing what it can find. When we follow these, these urges, then we get this dopamine that seems to be the reward center that when we follow the urge, then our body gives us this dopamine and that feels good. That feel, makes life feel, humans would use the word zest, but just this, this idea that it's interesting, that it's fun, it's stimulating. Here's one more thing I'll throw out to you, and you know, we can follow up on any one of these, but there's all this evidence in zoos that if you just give animals their food, and it's totally healthy food, you know, it's like has all the nutrients and proteins that they need, they die, they get sick a lot more and they die a lot earlier if you just give it to them compared to when you kind of make them work for it. Like they have to find it, they have to chase it. So there's something about just having all the resources being given to you that actually is not good for our systems. Let me give a slightly fun, simple example. As I just mentioned to you, I was in Beijing last week and I happened to be at a dinner with a large group of people. And it was kind of set up as a little bit of a touristy thing. And it was kind of at this older kind of temple area and mostly Americans on this trek. And there happened to be, let's say, 10 Chinese ladies dressed in traditional garb, younger ladies, quite attractive. And they were kind of like lining the entrance and they were dressed head to toe in traditional garb, the headdress and holding a lantern. And, you know, no one was talking to them. They were just standing there like monuments, you know. So I went over and I tried to like just strike up a chat, not to hit on them or anything, but just to kind of like to learn something, to find something out, to explore, to get them to talk. And I was thinking to myself, I wonder what everyone else in the group is thinking, looking at me, because they're not doing that. To them, they're in their bubble. They're in their routine. They're not really exploring. I mean, yes, they got to Beijing on the trip and all that kind of stuff. But what is it about routine that it, it's kind of shaped us in going back to the Industrial Revolution? Like, this routine thing is really, really bad for us. I mean, some of these routines that we've, we're have we developing in, in modern life we're losing touch with, with humanity, aren't we? Okay, well. I just throw it all out there, man. You know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing that's really cool about routine for humans, routines end up feeling like cultures. They end up feeling like unwritten norms and rules. There's a couple of thoughts that I had as you were speaking there. The first one is that if culturally, you know, these unwritten rules are kind of governing us to stay in a line, wait and do what's told, you know, that's a strong norm that might be competing with part of our brain that's saying explore, try new things. And it's very interesting and even like kind of meta that in some Far East cultures, there are really strong norms against exploring and trying new things and just getting experimenting. So that, you know, it's almost like a double whammy in some ways where not only are there norms that keep us structured, the structures are do things traditionally the way they've always been done. Because there's something really cool, you know, again, I don't have all this stuff sorted yet. It's just that what we can do is we can hold up that there is this functional part of the brain that urges us to do X, but then it's not as though that's unilateral. It's not as though that means we're all going to do X. And in fact, like I'll throw two things out. Number one, there's a seeking system that causes us to explore, but there's also a fear system that causes us to fear, you know, that causes us to worry about threat. It causes us to, you know, not want to get ourselves in physical or psychological threat. Right off the bat, those two things are kind of keeping us honest, if you will. There's sort of like two ends of a continuum. And 
sometimes one's good and sometimes the other is good. So we could talk about that piece of it. That's one thing. But the second thing that I think is interesting is just because we have this neuroscience, this neurological system urging us to do something, it's not as though there's not social norms and social urges that might work against it. Some people kind of blow by those social norms. They kind of somehow or another, they realize the seeking system dopamine release is so valuable to them. The social Sounds norms, like the social, <laughs> yes, exactly. The social norms cease to exist. <laughs> yes. Have you heard of the personality trait called openness to experience? Have you heard of that one? I've not heard of it in probably the uh, technical way that you're going to explain it to me right now. There seem to be about five human traits that you can use to describe human differences. You could call like personality are within person patterns of behavior that are kind of consistent across time that allow you to vary across people. So like there might be one person that's really open to new experiences and that includes some of the things you have already mentioned, like to travel, like to try new foods, like to experience new culture. But you also are really open to like Art, which is often challenging existing assumptions. You get chills of excitement when you get your assumptions challenged by art or by music. This is a personality trait. Some people load really high on it. It sounds like people like you and I would load really high on that dimension. And there's other people that are quite close to new experiences. Like once they've gone to a place and enjoyed it, they'd want to keep going back there. Because for them, I've already found the thing I like, so I'm going to keep doing it. Whereas for me and maybe you, once I've been to a place, I wouldn't go back. I mean, I liked it, but like, that's why I wouldn't go back because I already know I like that. I got to find out what else. And this is just one of these really interesting traits that we all have seeking systems. If you don't have a seeking system, you're probably severely depressed and you're probably not doing podcasts. If you know what I mean, you're not in the work world, you're not out in the world, you're depressed, and maybe you're trying to kill yourself. You're going to an important place, though, because it really becomes what is a seeking system for each person. I will further share with you, having just been back to the States for a few weeks, and I don't make it back too often, but seeing friends and family, and I'm not talking down or anything, but you know, here they got this crazy guy in their family and their friend circle, me, who's running around the world, just going in a completely different direction. And when I observe them, some people, you can see immediately, I can tell them a story about something, let's say about uh, Vietnam or China, and they immediately get excited, very small number, and they want to know more. And they got, you know, maybe I can make a trip there. And then there's a certain number of people that are just like, yes, Mike exists, he's sitting there, but whatever he's talking about that's outside of my horse blinders, I literally can't register. There's walls built that I don't even know if they know they're there anymore. Almost like it's down to the level of assumptions. And I don't know if this is right or wrong. It, they could feel threatened. Obviously, I grew up in the United States as well. A lot of my family don't travel. I think several of them only got passports to come visit me. I don't think my brother has a passport. But the idea would be if you're talking about these other cultures, well, then they must be wrong because we've got the right one, that feeling of I'm threatened that there are, for instance, other religions, or I'm threatened that they would eat that way, you know, without those accoutrements, those forks and knives, or that they would have different foods that I didn't grow up with. For some people, that's interesting and compelling. And that's something I want to know more about. I'm curious about, isn't it interesting how diverse the world is? And there's other people, it's the blinders are there because that creates threat. Pretty interesting conversation. Can you find a good seeking system that lets you have a decently happy life if you've truly got the horse blinders on? Let's just keep playing with it. I think the answer is yes, believe it or not, because we all have our blinders on to some degree. And we all have assumptions that we make about the world. And we also have you know, experiences that we expect, even though we may not expect the content of it, we might expect kind of what it, in general that's going to be like. So it's not as though any of us can kind of look at the other ones and say, Eureka, I've got it. And you don't. But I would say that within really blinded communities, as the individual in them, you still can find ways to learn new things, to try new things, to take on new approaches of using your strengths 
if there's certain things that you really enjoy doing and you like doing, and you might have like already got mastery around some of those skills, you know, being public speaking or writing an article or doing math, or writing programming code, whatever it is, you can end up being 30 years old and really know a lot about that. And then many of us then have to make a choice. And it's actually a pretty important choice. One is the idea of this fixed mindset, Carol Dweck, achievement mindset, where now that I have something mastered, let me continue to do that thing in that way to prove to everybody else that I'm competent, that I'm able to continue to achieve so that I feel good that I have this competence. And that's one mindset choice you can kind of make. And another mindset choice you can kind of make is, well, to stop growing and learning is kind of to die, not physically yet, but kind of emotionally and cognitively to die. If I just keep doing the same thing the same way, that's no life at all. Let me charge up my seeking system. Even though I might stay in the US, I might stay in the same state, I might stay in the same job, I might stay in the same programming language, but let me see if I can't figure out how to make it work this way or let me see if I can't figure out a new programming language that still would do the same thing, but would kind of be more elegant. But you see what I mean? It's, it's kind of like now, instead of being in this achievement mindset of getting it perfect and right, because I already know how to do it, it's kind of taking on a growth mindset of saying, let me try to, even though I know it won't, won't work as well the first time I try it, because I have to learn, that's actually the space that I want to be learning, growing, developing. And that's where the seeking system works really well. That's where you kind of get these intrinsic rewards as dopamine of trying, even though the results at first may not be as perfect. I might shift this in and out of work today in our conversation, but if we shift this into work, these seeking systems for the average person, I mean, I'm more of an entrepreneurial type. I have been for a long time. Some people can relate to that too, but a lot of people are going to relate more to the notion of a, of a workplace. But inside that workplace, I mean, I was shocked. I, I saw some of these, I guess these are stats that you would put together or you would call together talking about employee engagement, that two thirds of, I guess, whatever we're going to call typical employees are disengaged. Perhaps you can even define what disengaged might mean. I think we, we all have a kind of an instinctive feel for what disengaged means. But if 66% of the employee base is disengaged right off the bat to the uninitiated me, that doesn't sound good. The second thing is two stats I th I'd love to chat about. The first one is just this notion of like, are you engaged or not engaged? That's one you're bringing up. There's a second one that's even kind of more painful, which is 80% of the world. And, you know, this isn't just like, the US or the UK or the Far East or whatever. This is 63 countries, 101 companies, 1.7 million humans, you know, huge populations from very senior to very entry level work and job types. 80% say that they cannot be their best at work, that work is a place that they have to shut off what's best about them in order to get through it. And so that's, for me, the most impressing. And it's not as though it's an inalienable right. You know, it's not as though it's sort of like the world has to allow you to be your best. I just find it humanistically sad that the vast majority feel like they have to shut off to get through it because – you, know, you and I both know that work's where many of us spend most of our hours when we're not sleeping. Like, other than sleep, work's kind of what we do. As I think about this, though, really big picture, to take it back to big picture for a second before we keep diving into the notion of work and how some of your work applies to that, it sure seems like to me as an outsider looking in that this happiness that people really need activating this seeking system, ultimately, there's always going to be some incongruity when you are employed by somebody who ultimately is telling you what to do. And I know there's there's going to be some interesting things you can talk about today that kind of get away from the command and control 1800s industrial revolution model. But it, it seems like that's always going to be there in the background to some degree where, where people, you know, if they had their dream, would probably like to have the control to call their own shots. Boy, there's some great, great pieces to that question and this topic. One of them is human coordination. 
And then we're getting also back to where you and I were a little while ago around culture. One of the things that makes human beings so dominant, and I don't mean great, by the way, you know, we're kind of bad for the planet, but one of the things that makes us dominant as a species is not that we're strong or that we have like the sharpest teeth, <laughs> you know, we're, we're like kind of crap apes, you know, like we don't have very good muscles, really. We don't have a shell on our back to protect us. You know, we're not made well, you could say it that way. We're not organically, we're not good specimens. But what we are supreme at is this coordination and this thinking about the future. So if you read like Yuval Harari has that book called Sapiens, it's a short history of about 30,000 years. And it looks at how we rose out of the food chain. And one of the most important things that we do is we coordinate our behavior. So do ants, but then we also coordinate it toward futures that are, don't exist yet. And you put those two things together and we become really, really powerful. That's one of the things that culture does, first off, in society that coordinates behavior. It lets us kind of get on with things, if you know what I mean. It gives predictability. It gives routines. It gives ways of acting that we can kind of, you know, if you're on that side of the road and I'm going 60 miles an hour on the other side of the road, we kind of have this trust that we're not going to collide. And it's really dangerous. Like we're within a foot of each other, we're moving 60 miles an hour in opposite directions. But we trust that we're not going to collide because of culture, right? Because of norms, rules. I think that the same thing can be brought into organizational life, which is if you have a farm, let's go back. You have a farm. And that's what most people used to do. If you went back 150 years, most people did farming. Enough of subsistence living, if you will. Well, there's a sense in which the culture is dictated by growing seasons and like what helps the plants grow. You know what I mean? But if all of a sudden you're going to have 60,000 people operating something that grows food, that markets food, that delivers food, that does logistics around food, that does financing around food, that does packaging around food, most of the culture, most of the norms aren't really like based on nature. It's based on what some smart person says you should do today. If that smart person could automate it all, which they might be able to do in the not too distant future, then that creates a whole nother issue too. And we can go to that too. I like that. I see a lot of hope in that actually. Don't let me send you off on a tangent. You, I can send you off on too many tangents. What I'd say about that is two things. And then we, we actually can talk about the sort of AI machine learning stuff. But this approach, let's say it was around 1880, 1900, say it was called the Industrial Revolution. That approach kind of assumed that a smart person could figure stuff out, set it up, and then it would be pretty consistent. Not quite stagnant. It's not like the Henry Fords of their day thought nothing would change, but they did paint the car black for 13 years before consumers' taste changed. Like, and today we don't get 13 years. <laughs> right, about 13, you know, 13 minutes, 13 now. seconds. Exactly. I mean, it's just... It's kind of insane to think about a world in which you would create a system where all the people acted the same way eight hours a day for 13 years. And then the, the next big change was we're going to add a second color. You're still going to put those four screws on that hub. The whole machine of people interface with an assembly line, that's all going to be the same, except we're going to add a second color. Like that was the big change. That's how when we set up management, we kind of had started with the assumption of lots of stability. And I think that one of the big things that's very hopeful about the world now is making humans into machines doing repetitive small acts with no experimentation. That seems to be a less robust way to run an organization. It doesn't seem nimble enough. It doesn't seem agile enough. It doesn't seem to adapt quick enough. So those organizations seem like they're going under. You're using the word seem. I think there's actually a stronger word that you'd probably use, yeah. right? The people, the employees, the individuals in an operation that are stuck in the routine, repetitive actions are not getting any of the benefits that you're talking about in your work from the seeking system. That's right. They're not getting the exploration, the trying new things, the experimentation. They're not getting the um, ingenuity. They're not getting the proactive creativity of employees 
trying something to fix a problem before management knows it's a problem, what happens is those organizations become like competition machines. They become winning machines because they're basically consuming the environment at a quicker rate and then adapting to that consumption at a quicker rate and not waiting for it to go up six layers of command and then having the smart person at the top saying, aha, I see that we need to start doing it differently. I and my ivory tower can now say, start doing it this way. That's a really lethargic change. That's like a change resistant machine. This is actually part of my hope because I'm a humanist, I'm a psychologist. I actually like seeing those organizations die. You know, this is like Schumpeter. This is like creative destruction, you know, where the world is taking those old school organizations and just running havoc with them, the Kodaks and the Blockbusters and the, you know, whatever, the organizations that seem so powerful and strong 10 years ago, $80 billion companies, 10 years later, they just couldn't adapt. And for me, this is kind of interesting because what it means is the management and the leaders that say what we have to do is empower our workers to try new things, to adapt. We have to be activating their seeking systems. We have to allow them to use their best skills to grow us. Those seem to be the organizations that are thriving. That's great. That's great for humanity. More of those workers are more turned on more of the time. How would you counter, let's pretend for a second that I'm, I'm Jeff Bezos and I've done exceptionally well in the last 20 years and I've got a business that requires me to have some staff, more than a few, to help put goods in a box and make sure the right label gets on it. About as repetitive a process as one can imagine. Now, obviously, Bezos has figured out a very good system. It's working really well. It's making himself and his investors a lot of money. And perhaps he is implementing some of the many things that, that you might espouse in your book, Alive at Work. Perhaps he is. But I'm going to guess, because I mean, I read some, uh, you know, some anecdotal reports out there, and you know, it kind of sounds like a, probably a tough existence to be an Amazon frontline worker packing boxes. That seems really tough. But how do you counter the success or someone might say, hey, Dan, the success speaks for itself. Look what we've done here. But there is a way, perhaps, that you can take some of these extra outside-the-box steps to give the employees that seeking system, even in an Amazon-like system. The first thing I'd say is that's the seams. I'd never want to come off as the kind of person that thinks he has all the answers. When I use the word seams... You also can take Ryan, you know, what's it called? Ryanair. It's another really good example of a pretty draconian system where, you know, lots of employees might say, boy, that's not much fun working there. And yet they are existing and maybe even thriving as an organization. I don't think that it's the case that they're sort of the answer and that all works. I think that it's not like I've worked at Amazon. I have interviewed some folks that have worked there and I've read some stuff about them. So I'm almost talking at the same level as a consumer, a consumer of media and a consumer of products. You know, I sort of obviously buy a lot from Amazon. But a couple of thoughts there. Number one is, my guess is that that is a very change-oriented, experimenting-oriented organization because a lot of what they do is they talk about, we're not going to get 10 percent better in five years. We're going to get 10 times better. Those sorts of challenges to bring out these sort of voice activated systems that they've brought out that allows you to sort of say, hey, play a song or whatever. The speed at which they brought those forward demands an enormous ingenuity of conceptualizing, of inventing, of packaging, of pricing, of distribution. I think the idea of like almost same day service, the amount of AI and predictive forecasting and predictive analytics and the amount of new programming and of new ways of using shipping systems, you know. It's off the hook. It's crazy innovative. It's crazy. It's the kind of change orientation that I bet you and I can't even handle. 
my point was really, and look, I've seen Jeff talk about this, that basically, you know, they're constantly making experiments and they don't know what's going to succeed and they have to keep taking shots. And he goes, you never see the thousands of things that fail. Exactly. But, 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 but <laughs> if I just keep it at that simple level, so I don't sound like I'm like just picking on Amazon because you lay out all the positives even more so than me. But if I take it back to that level of like, hey, we're pretty efficient right now at having humans repetitively put the products in the boxes and ship it. And I just, even at that level, and we don't even have to use Amazon because that's almost a, that's almost an old line type repetitive function that's been happening for a long time, packing a box. But it just seems like, you know, what, what could be some of the ways that without you knowing all the details and without us trying to say that Amazon is going in the wrong direction, but what are some of the ways and you might even want to take another example. What are some of the ways, though, that you have seen or you have proposed? I mean, for example, play is one thing that you've talked about. What are some of the ways, though, that you can see that people can improve? Because, I mean, we've got this great focus on efficiency, but efficiency is not the only game in town. That's right. So I think that there'd be these you know, three triggers. That, and I'm going to use the word seem again. There seem to be three defensible triggers of the seeking system. And by defensible, I mean, there's empirics and science under these three. I bet you there's more. But the three that I really focus on are this first one being, we've already talked about playing, experimenting, trying new things. And one of the things that I've seen organizations do in that space is give people amounts of time where they can make their own improvements to their own job, where they can craft the job around their own perspectives or that they can try a new way to do an old thing and it doesn't always work, but that's what learning means. You know, so that's one. If we also take a step out of work, because I know that that's part of what you and your listeners are interested in, we can do this in our own lives. And it's less about efficiency, trying to be as efficient as possible, and more about activating that seeking system because it makes life better and makes us more agile in our thinking. So like one of the things that my wife and I are currently doing is we were taking up classes. We met in an English literature class way back in university. And we're taking classes now where we take Mondays, two and a half hours on a Monday, and we go and take a class. And that that also means we're reading literature all week to prepare for that class. And that feels really exploratory. It feels experimental. It feels really fun. It kind of wakes you up. It gets you out of the routine. But it isn't efficient at all. You know, you could say like, well, that's wasted time. <laughs> yes. And it puts that enthusiasm, that zest back into life. So that's one, that, that trigger of experimentation is there. A second one, which can be related, is this notion of playing to strengths and trying to understand who you are when you're at your best and then trying to play to those strengths more often at work. This might be the idea of there might be certain parts of the job where you feel like you're at your best, or there might be certain things out of work in your real life where you feel like that's something really unique about me. It's either a perspective or a talent or a skill or something I just love. You, know, you could call that a passion. How can I use that more often? How can I bring that into my role? How can I use it as a way to charge up what I do? How can I make it more than just a job for money, but something where I can bring my whole self in to that part of work? So I think that's really important, this idea of trying to reflect on who we are when we're at our best and how do we become that a little bit more often. There's some really good evidence that that lights up this part of our brain, the seeking system, even just reflecting on it. And writing about it lights up this part of our brain. So that's the second trigger. And we can dive into any no, of these go, three go, triggers. Do, make sure you get the third one in there. I know you had a third one. Yeah, the third one has to do with personalizing the purpose of your actions. What that means is, like, if you're at work, the work probably has a certain mission statement that's online. You know, it's on the internet. It's on the website. And it might even be something that your senior, senior boss talks about. It might be something that a senior leader walks around saying a lot. But like it may not touch you emotionally at all. It may not be you just don't buy it. Personalizing the purpose has to do with, A, you coming up with your story of why you do what you do beyond the money. I get paid to work here because I got to make money. But in addition to that, here's something about the work that actually matters to me. That has a lot to do. When you're talking about personalizing your purpose, you're looking at 
who am I affecting with my work? Like when I do it really well, who gets happy? How are they affected in a positive way? And when I mess this up, when I really, really mess up my job, who cares? Who gets affected? Who notices? I've worked with a lot of companies on allowing a lot of the behaviors of the work to remain consistent, but to allow people to feel the impact of those behaviors is something that seems to activate this part of the brain and seems to deliver this jolt of dopamine and gives people zest. I'll stop with those three, but in this book, you know, Alive at Work, I was really able to uncover the science, literally the science, the, the neuroscience underneath that, but also pepper it with a bunch of stories of what real life leaders are doing in those areas. As you talk about purpose, I'm jogging the mind here to a particular book that you may, not, may or may not have seen. It was a Wall Street book from back in the day called Liar's Poker, written by an author named Michael Lewis, who has written a ton of books. And that was his first one. And in Liar's Poker, he goes to work for Solomon Brothers, a big investment bank at the time. And he describes a training class. And basically, all the guys are in that room in the 1980s, sitting there knowing, as long as they don't screw up, they're going to make millions of dollars. And Lewis describes the training room as like, you know, with the head guy from one of the Solomon Brothers head guys. Basically, if you blink wrong, that guy can fire you and you're out on the street. You don't make the money. So there's a huge fear thing there, right? So that's that's just one scenario from back in the day, a kind of a real financial incentives. You do what you're told and you're going to make a lot of money. And you might have to, you know, when we say jump, you're yelling back how high. Compared to today... If I show up at a new organization or if anyone shows up at a new organization and there's kind of an onboarding process for the first day contrasted with Solomon Brothers from back in the 1980s. And they say actually what you would were just saying, like, hey, listen, yes, we want to make money with our firm that you're joining today, but we want you to have your personal purpose. We're going to talk about it from day one because we think that we're going to be more valuable as a company. You're going to be more valuable as a person. If that purpose part is genuine and you believe in it, why don't you contrast those two and then take it a step further to where we are today, where financial incentives probably don't rock and roll the same as they do probably 30 or 40 years ago, do they? Especially in that financial area, if we're talking about banks and, and you know, investment firms and so on, at least for now, we've moved away from the Wild West <laughs> and a lot of the financial organizations I work with, folks joining aren't really expecting to get wildly rich anymore. <laughs> the odds aren't very good. There's something really interesting there that shifted. The second thing that shifted is if we take an organization and a culture, a broader culture than the organization of the 80s, I guess what was expected still was that you might work at that organization a pretty long time and maybe that that organization had already figured out the right way to do things. There was a certain way of acting that worked for us and you have to act that way. And we know that that works best. Again, it's not quite assembly line 1900s, but kind of, you know, kind of like our coordination demands that you do that widget movement so that over here, this person can do this bit of widget movement and all those repetitive actions sew up to something called coordinated action and we can win. We can win because we do that quicker and more efficiently. So don't mess up. Don't get in the way of our system. Don't try something new. Like don't go creating because I'm going to call that a mistake because we already know what the right answer is. You just have to do it. That doesn't feel like today. And it's not as though I know every organization but what I do know is that all the organizations, including mine, are in this watch, try something new, and adapt state. And if we don't do that, we become irrelevant really quickly. <laughs> and I don't even mean like in years. It, it seems like in six to ten months. And in some, you know, if you are in IT, and sometimes banking is really fused with IT now, you might only have three months before basically you're not competitive anymore and you have to lay off 40% of your people, that kind of thing. So it feels to me like, why, what are we doing here? Number one is internet is pretty new. 
full information all around the world at all times, you know, all knowledge, all human knowledge in your pocket kind of thing. Computing power, the idea that humans can't possibly keep up with what the computers are able to do. Maybe that leads to machine learning and AI. So especially in investment banks, ideas around predictive forecasting being way better than humans at predicting trends, blockchain, meaning you know full transparency of all information, everybody cutting out all those middle trades, all the sort of middle actions that used to add value. Wow, it's stunning to think that some smart person at the top is gonna to sort all that out and then teach a bunch of newcomers, here's what you'll be doing for the next five years. <laughs> You know, just that's not how it works. It's more like what we need are the smartest people using their best skills and understanding the real problems and then proactively bringing your best skills and perspectives to help us because we senior leaders, we're kind of detached. We see trends, but we don't really know how to act. We can't tell you quick enough how to adapt. You have to help us. So one of the things I talk about in the book that seems pretty important is this concept of humble leadership or even servant leadership where leaders that win are ones that start with the assumptions that I don't know the best way to act. I have to learn that from my employees who are actually are solving problems. And my job isn't to tell them what to do, it's to provide resources and training so that they can help me understand how to act. That's really been a big switch. I don't think it's even switched yet. I think we're on the front end of this. I think that a lot of leaders would still say that the employees are there for me. The employees serve me. That's why they're called employees. And what a lot of leaders are starting to understand is, no, it's the opposite. They're not human resources that serve me. They are the resource that I serve. <laughs> Let me keep it there for a second, because I jotted some comments down from you. I'm paraphrasing a little. You can correct me if I'm my paraphrase is off, a little controversial sounding, and I'm assuming that these comments were directed at kind of longstanding established companies. And just a few quick lines. You talked about that many leaders today are on a power trip. You mentioned that many leaders today kind of often cheating to get the money, so to speak. And they're often delusional that they think they're so much better than the frontline employees, and they often don't perceive or understand their own luck. Now, I could play devil's advocate and I could I could listen to those statements and I could try to be one of those leaders. But then I guess when I read your perspective about that, I was thinking, well, you know, again, I didn't know what type of companies you were talking about. I think it might be harder to say a startup out of a garage is, has those perspectives. But for the established companies, I would think, you know, okay, you know, if it happened to be some large car company that's been around and somebody works their way up the bureaucratic rank over 20 or 30 years, yeah, I think it'd be they they would really need to kind of look in the mirror because that you know that system that operation is going to go on when they're gone. Those comments were fair comments in terms of just an overall perspective on some leaders that are in that headspace and need to get out of that headspace. Some of those comments they're different prongs, maybe of the same fork, but they're different prongs. And maybe we'd take them one at a time. Even you know, pick one of your favorites and we'll dive in. But the lucky part, I think people often. Lucky's a yeah, good one. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, but before we we're lucky we're alive that, right there. I mean, you know, that's 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 luck. Yeah, we get to have this conversation. I think that there's probably some use in trying to like empathize with the listeners right now. First off, I think there's some use in remembering why that's important. And the first one is practical. So if we're literally talking about leaders in organizations that are trying to create winning instead of losing, we're trying to create competitive advantage instead of value destruction. If we're at the level of the leader serving the organization's goals, then I think that I would be able to argue and show a lot of evidence that if you are on a power trip and you do think you know best and you think your job is to tell others how to do their jobs, then I think you won't be serving your organization very well. That's not just an opinion, you know, that has to do with if you want creativity and innovation and proactive solutions and you want employees thinking like owners and trying to help you before you even understand there's a problem, if that's what you want, that seems to be what wins now, then the old school, top down, we have the answer, 
let me tell you how to do it. And if you don't do it right, I'm going to punish you. That demonstrably is leading to the wrong results for the organization. So I myself, as Dan Cable, I'm not trying to even give a value judgment there. I'm just trying to say, <laughs> I'm in the business of trying to help leaders create organizations that win. And that seems to be what wins, at least right now. So that's one thing I just wanted to put out there. I'm more interested in where you and I are going to go now, which are the value judgments, which have to do with if you go through life feeling entitled to your status, you know, like you and I, it looks like we were both born white males. White males get affirmative action every day. <laughs> you know, you and I have gotten affirmative action every day of our entire lives. Now, it doesn't feel that way to us. You know, it kind of feels like we work hard and so on. But compared to, let's say, an African-American female, if all else equal, we haven't had to work as hard as she would have to get to the same place. And there's two ways to run it. One is to kind of get threatened and point to how hard you work and how you deserve everything. And the evidence suggests that that feeling of entitlement leads to a worse life because then that entitlement makes you demand more and think you deserve more. And then when you don't have everything, you kind of get <laughs> that greed makes you unhappy, if you will. There's all this evidence that if you counterintuitively accept that you're just lucky, just got lucky to be born in a country where there's education, got born into a situation where you got a job or, you know, you, you kind of get to make a lot of your own choices, et cetera, et cetera. If you just realize that's mostly luck, I work hard, but so does everyone else. Then you can, you actually can feel really grateful and gratitude is the best predictor of life satisfaction. It's a bit counterintuitive, but I really love the topic and I wondered what you think of it. It's interesting because I think you're, if you are in, let's say corporate America, and let's say it's, and look, I've got plenty of conservative libertarian friends and they're, they probably already had their head explode in the last one minute. If you're in corporate America, it's generally, let's say, white guy dominated. And I walk into the room, you know, I'm not in corporate America, but if I walk into the room and an African-American woman walks into the room, I mean, like, we'd all have to be crazy not to think there's be an advantage to be the white guy walking in the room. Okay, so there's definitely an advantage there. I think the interesting thing apart about this discussion is where it gets three-dimensional outside of America. So, for example, spending time in Asia, it's so interesting to watch. You see Japan at the top of the food chain, China catching up fast, Taiwan, and then you see the, 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 the different interplay between Asian countries entirely outside of the white black dynamic in America. And of course, we all know that if there wasn't affirmative action, every one of the college seats at the Ivy Leagues would be taken by an Asian student because they would have the best grades. So it becomes a really interesting conversation when you expand it to the global perspective, you know, it gets messy and it's tangled and you're right. And in a big picture standpoint, walking around feeling like you're entitled absolutely doesn't help you in any way, shape or form. You might think it helps you, but it really doesn't help you because you know why? If I'm in Asia, which I am right now today, trust me, I'm the minority. Okay. If I walk around with my chin too far up that I think my does not stink, guess what? A lot of people see that. They might not tell me they see it, but they see it and they know it. And they've seen it for a long time from people that have come into their culture and acted that way. It's a can of worms that we just opened up. <laughs> I like it. I like it a lot. And part of why I like it so much is it has to do with how do you create winning teams? That's what I talked about a second ago. If you need to create a local winning team, is arrogance or humility a better approach to doing that? There's something really interesting. There's lots of really interesting stuff there. But the second thing, which right now we're closer to, is what leads to a better life? When you go to die, what led to more happy engaged, fulfilled days. That's really an interesting one too. Uh, that's completely aside from the workplace and what serves organizations, what helps you win, blah, blah, blah. What I'm talking about is those of us that have had, I don't know, like, I don't know if you want to use the word crisis or trauma, but like sometimes when you get really, really sick in the book, I wrote a little bit about getting cancer and getting stage four cancer. 
when you start to understand how vulnerable you are, you know, we all are, but you start to believe it, that vulnerability gets personalized. You actually see, oh, okay, we could all be dead tomorrow. That's been really interesting for me because that's let a lot of humility in, you know, that vulnerability, that sense of like, it can all change in a second. And we're these fragile creatures that just kind of stumble around. <laughs> and, you know, some of us get 50 years and some get 30 and some get 80, but it's quick for all of us. You know what I mean? When you kind of let that into your heart, you allow that almost like that mortality salience in, you allow mortality to be pervasive in your brain. It really can help you delight in the day in day out pleasures, like a conversation on Skype, <laughs> you can open up to uncertainty a lot better because instead of it being a threat, you can treat it as, well, that's interesting. Let me see what I can do with that. You know, let me see if I can use this opportunity to learn something. Now we're back to the growth mindset, fixed mindset. I think that a lot of people who are on this, you know, this power trip and this entitlement thing, they think it's better for them, but the science would suggest that they're way more threatened. Like when China becomes the superpower, so to speak, that's a threat for them rather than, well, you know, you had your turn and England had its turn and, you know, Portugal had its turn. They got, and, China's know, got like, 1.4 billion people and they work a lot harder than the average American. Exactly. So they're going to win. The math says they're going to win. They're going to win. So, but like, rather than that being a threat, just treat it as like, well, you know, history has different people at the top at different times. And that's interesting. That's important. That's powerful to know about. I'm curious about that. You know what I mean? I just think that we're on to such a great conversation here because it's, it is much bigger than work. All of this applies to work, to be curious about change at work, to be feeling vulnerable and saying, but I can learn. Of course, things are going to change a lot. And of course, my skills aren't going to be very valuable very long. In five years, most of the things I'm doing today won't be very valuable unless I update them. This could be seen as very threatening. Either way, it's very true. So it's sort of like how three years ago, I'd never done a podcast. How do I get good at podcasts and be interesting and be provocative or do more, <laughs> do more. And also like social media two years ago, I don't think I'd ever been on social media. Now I'm trying to like work on delivering value to, you know, a bunch of people on Twitter, you know, let me keep you at your entitlement point for a second. I was just kind of pondering people that I've encountered in my life that have appeared entitled often. I would say for me, the people that I've seen most entitled probably, and I'm not saying they're bad people, this friends, family, associates that I've known for a long time, generally older white guys who have secured pretty good fortunes, nice house, all that kind of fun stuff. But so many of these guys that I've known in my life, you know, they get to be in their 70s or 60s, even even 50s, even 40s. They've let their body go. They're just consuming lots of intoxicants, whatever that intoxicant might be, bad intoxicants. And I'm not trying to be preachy here, but it's kind of funny that the person that is entitled, that has enough cash to build the moat, then goes ahead and is taking all these bad actions, whether the food or the intoxicants, to put themselves in a state where the child observing, the child psychologist observing would say, well, are you depressed? What's wrong with you? I mean, I thought you're the guy that's in charge. You're the guy that's that's reached the pinnacle. And why are you acting like you're not happy? Because they're really not happy. And I've been there. Maybe we all get there a little bit sometimes. But it seems like what happens for some of us is you get, sometimes even early in life, as you said, 35, 40 years old, you get all the goodies that were supposed to make you happy. You know, the houses and the cars and all that stuff. And it seems like you've got the job everybody said was the win, but then you just kind of start doing it repetitively. Now we're back to that comment I made way back when. You kind of just, well, this is the thing that works, and so I'm just going to keep doing this thing. And you don't take on exploration. You don't take on curiosity. You don't come on with playfulness. You just kind of go through the routines, and you're not lighting up your own seeking system. And there's a lot of evidence that if you stop feeling that sense of purpose, you stop feeling that zest, you know, then you, <laughs> you start this downward spiral of depressive symptoms. 
Is there any evidence right now that in terms of chasing the seeking system in our modern life that women are doing it better than men? Or is that just anecdotal on my part? I don't have the evidence, but I would say that it seems like a lot of the things that align with the seeking system and with humble leadership, by the way, are more traditionally feminine traits or cultures. You know, it could be men or women. You know, we're not talking even about sex here. We're talking about femininity. The traditional look at femininity would be inclusive, cooperative, sharing oriented, getting people involved, not being dominant, not being arrogant, not chest beating. <laughs> you know, like literally the, the male were gorilla beating the chest, like, you know, that sort of dominance displays. We're not saying it's all bad to be a guy. We're just saying that there's, it's, it's a wide perspective. Uh, there's, a, there's a big toolbox here. There's lots of things to take in. I like that a lot. You're going to wrap up here soon, so we can't kind of solve this when it's bigger. But I do think that it's really interesting to think about guys, meaning that being a male, but taking on what are traditionally female stereotypes might be one of the best paths to success right now. And maybe we need to stop even calling them male and female. It's the way they're described in the literature. But if what we're talking about being more effective is getting people involved, trying to be inclusive and create a sense of belonging, not assuming that you already know all the answers and you have to sort of force people into doing it with dominance displays. If I think about like that liar's poker 1980s banking environment, my gosh, the masculinity and the sort of dominance displays and, you know, just all that territorial, I know best, smartest guy in the room. Like that whole thing is sounding so old fashioned now. And so that culture would create a non-learning environment where the best thing you could do is act like you knew everything. And if you admit to not knowing everything, then you're seen as weak and therefore disregarded. And it's sort of like, what a recipe for disaster as a leader and as a firm. You know what I mean? Daniel, you for sure are going to give my audience plenty to think about. The book, Alive at Work, The Neuroscience of Helping Your People Love What They Do. Now, look, you go into, as we mentioned at the top, you go pretty much into the workplace. And people might think this is just me and you sharing opinions today. But when they look at your notes and your index, they're going to realize there's a lot of detail behind. There's a lot of research, a lot of data. So this is not just uh, you espousing. There's, There's a lot behind what you're saying, a lot of work, a lot of research which I implore people to check out. Hey, is there a website that people should uh, check out that you want them to go to? I'm at dan-cable.com. Okay. I could probably pick your mind and perhaps we could do a second conversation sometime in the near future. And I'm sure we could go for hours, but you know, you've got to pay the bills and work and all that kind of stuff too. Me too. So, but it's been really fun talking with you. Thanks for, um, thanks for reaching out. And it's been a good conversation. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you. 